Our scripture reading today is from the Old Testament is Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. They can be found on the Pew Bible, page 784. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law into, in their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor to, or a brother, a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And from the New Testament, we're going to the Gospel of John, and it's... Uh, Let's see, chapter 12, verses 20 to 33, page 1065. <clears throat> now there were some Greeks among, among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in, in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it, it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time. Judgment on the world. For judgment on the world now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This ends the readings from the scriptures. Good morning. Yesterday, uh, I was approved by the presbytery, and some of the church members came to the presbytery meeting to uh, celebrate the moment. I appreciate all of you to uh, be part of uh, the process. And, and I have great hope in God that we can come together to accomplish the mission that God allows us. But snow is different. <laughs> another snow and another snow. It made me look up the sky and say, oh, Lord. That's enough. <laughs> In my own dictionary now, the definition of snow is something beautiful only in the picture. The more snow I have, the bigger anticipation of spring I have. But there is a, special, a spiritual lesson from the frequent snow days. The darkest hour is just before the dawn. Do you agree? All we have to do is to have faith in God who will cast away the darkness of the world 
as much as we believe the final victory of the light of God, we can do many meaningful, meaningful ministries with God in confidence. Now let's all rise and share the love and peace of Jesus Christ with one another. There is a funny story about, uh, about a pastor uh, told by a pastor's wife in Virginia. Her husband, James Rolls, was invited to preach in a small rural church in Tennessee where his close friend was a pastor. However, the elder uh, who was to introduce him to the congregation had trouble pronouncing his name. So James Rolls offered the, he, this verbal clue. Remember Rolls, like, like hot buttered Rolls for your breakfast. And it worked. When it came time to, for the introduction, the elder announced, we are pleased to have with us the Reverend James Biscuits. <laughs> I found this story uh, especially funny because I, I lived in the South for close to a decade. Biscuit and gravy is, there, there, is the most popular breakfast in the South, not rolls. So it was the pastor's mistake uh, to explain his name to the elder with breakfast menu. Because it's automatically biscuit, not, not roll. It is interesting to notice how people understand the same things differently. The people in the south say, y'all. And the people in the north say, you guys. When the people in the north understand country music as a genre of music, but the people in the south agree that it is what you hear nonstop on almost every single radio station. The only variation between different radio stations is, is that some stations play more modern style of country music, like Taylor Swift, while other stations keep it's, it's all style. Likewise, the people in the north are surprised to hear yes sir or yes ma'am frequently as they travel to the south. Even in the same country, we find cultural differences as we travel along. In today's passage, we can see how Jesus and his disciples understood the same people differently. John 12, 20 says, there were some Greeks who wanted to see Jesus. The Passover festival was approaching and many Jews traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate, uh, celebrate the, the eight-day festival called Unleavened Bread, beginning with Passover day. Even though those Greeks were Gentiles, they came to Jerusalem during this time to celebrate the Jewish Passover. When they came to one of Jesus' disciples named Philip, he did not know what to do. Have you ever stood perplexed by encountering someone uh, and you didn't know what to do? I did. When I was six, I saw a foreigner, an American, for the first time in my life. He was a U.S. soldier deployed to Korea, and he called me and my friend while holding candies in his hand. It turned out that he went to, we went to too close to the army base uh, in Korea. My friend and I, I looked at each other and ran away because we were scared of him, the first Western guy in, my li in our lives. The Gospel of John does not say anything about the Greeks specifically, 
but I guess they look quite different uh, from the Gentiles they could see in the neighboring territories like Tyre or Sidon. Philip seemed to be afraid and confused. Besides, the Greeks called Philip Curious, the Lord, or Master. So he, that made him more scared. The foreigners call me Master. So Philip went to Andrew, another disciple, to ask for help. They looked like me and my friends staring at the American soldier in my childhood. They decide to ask Jesus about what to do. It's not clear if Jesus actually met with the, those Greeks, but he spoke as described in verse 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. To Philip and Andrew, the moment they met, met the Greeks was a, a mere surprise or an uncomfortable experience. But to Jesus, it was the moment of realizing Kairos, the moment of God, the sign of God to make him glorified. If you read the entire chapters of John 11 and 12, it seems that there, there were other occasions Jesus could call Kairos the, the hour, like when Jesus raised Lazarus from the death. So many people in Bethany, uh, which was only two miles away from Jerusalem, were amazed and believed in Jesus because of Lazarus. At the same time, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the council to discuss a plan to kill Jesus because so many people uh, believed in him already because of Lazarus. Then Jesus withdrew to a town called Ephraim, uh, 10 miles further north from Bethany, where he raised Lazarus. So for Jesus, this, this was not the time. This was not Kairos, the hour. After spending some time in Ephraim, Jesus came back to Bethany, and the people in the village made a, a grand feast for Jesus. Imagine Lazarus, who, was, who once died, and Jesus, who raised, him, raised this guy from death, are having a meal together on the same table. It should draw a lot of attention to them, right? If they had a Facebook at that time, the pictures of Jesus and Lazarus having a conversation on the eating table should fed their, their new feet all day long. But such a glorious moment was not a sign of Kairos, the hour, either. Even when Mary poured expensive perfume on the feet of Jesus in chapter 12, and wiped them with her, her hair so that the entire house was filled with the fragrance of perfume, which cost almost a yearly wages as close as $30,000 in our time. But still, it was not the sign of time, Kairos, for Jesus. However, the Greeks, the Gentile persons coming to see Jesus was the sign. And Jesus said, this is the hour. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Why? Why was the coming of the Greeks a sign of his time? Because it had been the, me it had been the message from the prophets in the Old Testament. Like Isaiah 55, verse 5 reads, Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which know you not 
will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Isaiah 63 also says, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. It should be noted that God called Israel to bless all people in the world. As God told Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless you, bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Just like Genesis, the book of Revelation also represents the same vision of the last day. Revelation 22, one, verse 1 and 2 says, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from, from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Verse 2, In the middle of his street, on either side of the, of the river, was a tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruits, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing for the nations. So for Jesus, the appearance of the Greeks was the sign of the hour of his glorification. He did not withdraw, he did not withdraw anymore, but instead he gave an analogy to his disciples. When a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it bears much fruit, comparing himself to a grain falling on the ground and dying. As I, I, read, as I read today's passage, what Jesus said about his glory is shocking to me. Jesus said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What glory? As I explained, Jesus was not talking about Lazarus as the proof of his glory, nor the cheering crowd as he entered Jerusalem. Here, Jesus identifies the cross as his glory. The cross itself is the glory of of Jesus. But but how? How can the cross be the glory of Jesus Christ? Not the miracles, not the resurrection, but the cross itself. If you read today's passage slowly, you may realize how Jesus speaks of the cross in in ways in which it contains ethos, pathos, and Logos, all together. It is, the, it is his ethos, ethos that Jesus showed his integrity perfectly. The cross was his glory because, the, because of his role given by God to save the humanity from the power of sin. He knew the cross was the manifestation of God's love and grace, So Jesus praised God by saying in verse 28, Father, glorify your name because of my cross. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. It is like a conversation between a father and a son when the son said, Daddy, you are the best. And the father said, thank you for being my son. But it is still about the integrity of Jesus because he also said in verse 27, Now my soul is troubled, but I'm not going to ask God for saving me from this cross because I know I have come for this reason. But instead, I'll glorify my my, my Father. Today's passage displays the pathos of Jesus as well. Jesus not only explained the meaning of the cross as a grain falling into the ground and dying, but also reminded his disciples of the general rule of discipleship. 
Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in the world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor them. So the cross is the rule of life to be passed down from Jesus to his disciples and to all believers to come. We also see the logos of Jesus because his speech crossed the, line, crossed the boundaries between God, Jesus, and his disciples freely. God, who gave Jesus the mission of salvation, was glorious. Jesus, who took the cross, was gl glorious. Then God would honor the disciples who followed Jesus by taking their own crosses. The line between the roles, role of Jesus and the task of his, his disciples in verse 24, 5, and 6 is quite, quite blurry. So needs our, our close attention. For example, in verse 24, Jesus is a grain, not us. But it is not clear if uh, Jesus only mentioned about himself because in 20, verse 25, the fruits are, uh, we are the fruits, and the fruits are supposed to play the same role in the world. So his role as a crane is also the role of the disciples in the world. Not to love their own lives, but to hate their lives to the extent that they are now on the same place where Jesus was, which is the cross. Jesus said, where I am, there will be my servant also. Then what is the result of the cross? We tend to believe that our salvation is the result of the cross. It may be correct from our point of view, but it's not an accurate statement from the perspective of Jesus. According to verse 31 and 32, the vision of Jesus in John was to judge the world, and to drive out the ruler of the, of the world. To drive out the ruler of the world, which is Satan, is the goal of this cross. And the cross is his disciples would take up. Beginning with the Greeks as the sign of the hour, Jesus unfolded his vision in verse 31 that the ruler of the world, the Satan, would be driven out through the cross. We talked about the promise of God to Abraham in Genesis and the final vision of Revelation in which all nations and all people will be blessed and glorify God. But it is only a part of the whole picture of the last day. We can find the image of the whole picture of the kingdom of God in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34, our another passage today. In 34, no longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. It is the same vision of Revelation 21, where it reads a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God will dwell among them, and, and they, will, they shall be God's people. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there, there, there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Behold, I'm making all things new. 
What does it mean that our final picture is to see the ruler of the world being cast away? I think it helps us understand the meaning of the church and the church mission. Many churches are involved in different missions, from food pantry ministry to social justice advocacy, from community dinner to overseas mission trips. So many needs and so many possibilities are waiting for us. Mandan Church has been involved in different missions as well. But one thing we have to keep in mind to, to keep the vision of Jesus in our hearts. Because that was the final picture of, of, of the vision of Jesus. A lot of Christians, including myself, understand mission as benevolent works. We may serve the people in need in our neighborhood, and those works look like benevolent works in the surface level. However, the Christian mission is more than that. It is ultimately the work to manifest the finer picture of the kingdom of God. For example, we may donate some food to the people in dire situations. But how can such a mission be accomplished in line with the final vision of Jesus Christ? In other words, is there any way for the same mission to be accomplished apart from the final picture of Jesus? And the answer is yes. If we collect all the donations and give them away without having compassion for the people and praying for their recovery, then our mission may have no picture of Jesus in our minds. Of course, not all the mission works are helpful and desirable. We can do our mission with a condescending attitude. We can patronize people through our missions. When we do our missions, the picture in our mind is to experience the oneness and the love in Jesus Christ. We help the people and pray for their recovery because we anticipate to become one body with them in the kingdom of God. So in this case, our benevolent works and social justice are not totally different missions. They are just different tasks for the same final picture. As I prepared this sermon, I read the conversation between uh, Frederick, Frederick Douglass and the President Lincoln again, which brings me this hope. In August 19, 1864, Douglas was invited to, the, invited to the White House to have a conversation with President Lincoln. Douglas was impressed that President Lincoln prolonged their conversation despite the arrival of Connecticut, Connecticut Governor William Cunningham. Douglas recalled this, this moment later and commented, this was probably the first time in the history of this republic when its chief magistrate found occasion or disposition to exercise such an act of impartiality, impartiality between persons so widely different in their positions and supposed claims upon his attention. In the reception of President Lincoln in the evening of the inauguration, Lincoln said to Douglas, Douglas, I saw you in the crowd today listening to my inaugural address. There is no man's, op there is no man's opinion that I value more than yours. I don't know if President Lincoln 
had this final vision of Jesus in his mind. But I believe this conversation well reflects the final vision of Jesus in many layers. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called to do God's ministry in this world. There is no distinction in the Bible between disciples and believers. It seems that the Paul's letter described disciples separate from believers, but Jesus never mentioned that it was okay to remain as believers only without being disciples. Then who are the disciples? In today's passage, John 12, 26 says, Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, where I am now, where I will be now, there will my servant be also. Please don't misunderstand. The cross does not mean just hard work, kind of work nobody wants to, to take. But it's a kind of work attempt, attempting to manifest the final picture of Jesus in our midst and in the world. And I hope and pray that the image of God wiping all the tears of the world is the model of our ministry and our mission in this world. Amen.